guys. So today I'm going to talk about dyes and dyes in history and how the steps you take to dyeing. So I wanted to start out with this video, this talk, this lecture with two quotes from a woman by the name of Parthenia Antoinette Vardman of Eufalia, Alabama during the American Civil War. She writes, I have often joined with neighbors in gathering roots, barks, leaves, twigs, sumacs, berries, walnuts for the heels, for the holes which dyed wool a beautiful dark brown. She also writes, great trouble is experienced in the beginning to find dyes with which to color our stuff. But in the course of time, barks, leaves, roots, and berries were found containing coloring properties. So that kind of shows you that humans have been using plants, um, mostly plants for a long time for dyeing stuff, particularly in the ancient world. And I'll get more into that in detail. So the first step, thing you do to start dyeing is you want to gather your fabric and weigh it. After you weigh your fabric, that can determine how much you're going to put in of your chemicals. The first step is called scouring, and scouring pretty much means that you're cleaning the fabric. Oftentimes, fabric is pre-treated with starches, and so you want to get rid of those starches. So you want to scour the fabric often, and you can use two kind of very popular ingredients. One is washing soda that I have here. The other one is called sodium hydroxide or soda ash. Um, it comes from their burnt organic material that is you find like when you burn or wood and stuff like that. It's that white material you find. And you gather that and that's what the sodium hydroxide lye is. And today it's used to clear drain. You can buy it at a hardware store. Um, it's a key ingredient in the production of soap making. You have to have soap and lye in order to make soap. It also unfortunately is a key ingredient in the production of meth nowadays. But, um, so yeah, usually you'd wash it with either so super washing soda or soda ash. Um, one interesting thing that I want to talk about, soda ash actually, soda ash lye, was I was talking to a woman who grew up on a farm in Oklahoma in the 1930s. And she told me that in the fall when they slaughter the animals, that's when they would gather the fat to make the soap. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. So yeah, so the next step is called mordanting. And mordanting comes from a French word, which means to bite. And pretty much the idea of mordanting, what you're doing with mordanting, is you're making the the dye molecules stick to the fabric. So imagine thinking about the dye molecules biting onto the fabric and hanging on and not letting go. Mordanting is what allows the fabric color to stay. It does so the color will stay and not wash out. Um, so it's a very important step, especially with protein and cellulose fibers, plant cellulose fibers, plant fibers. It's important to mordant. They don't take dye as well. Um, oftentimes we'll use, um, metal salts, um, such as alum, iron, tin, copper, chrome is often used, but it's very toxic. So I suggest not using that one. Um, so the common one that people use is alum. Also in stroke in history, urine was also used the ammonia sulfuric acid in urine also is a great mordant. So, um, vinegar is also a great mordant too, as it's an acid, um, Tannins and urine was also used oftentimes to tan leather in um, historical clothing. So that gives it some historical context. So the, the ingredients that I'm using today are, of course, alum, which is actually a solid form. And the way I got this was actually the crystal deodorant you get from natural health food stores. What's in there is alum. So I got unscented. And then I have vinegar and cream of tartar. Vinegar and cream of tartar is just kind of to add to the color, just kind of enhances the color of the mordant. Um, and if you want to think about being a dyer as kind of a painter and chemist, you kind of have to know the right chemicals to add and the right colors to mix to get the right shades or hues of colors that you want. So, um, but these are usually the key ingredients in the mordanting process. So the last step, which is the most important step that I'm going to talk a lot about is the actual dyeing of the fabric. And with these first two steps, you want to scour the fabric and then mortar the fabric and want to let it simmer for at least two hours. And then the, because the longer you let it simmer, let, let it set, the better the dye will hold on to the fabric, especially with mortaring stage. So dyeing fabric goes back as far as 10,000, 4,000 BC. There's evidence in the Neolithic era. Most famous natural dyes are red, blue, and purple. Natural dyes came from bark, leaves, fruits, and insects, and dyes often denote gender, status, and allegiance in history, which I will be talking about with these dyes. The first very famous dye that um, 
was discovered that people use that was natural was purple. Purple came from the Murex snail, snails, which was a mollusk, and it was discovered by the Phoenicians, and it's known as royal purple. And the reason why it's known as royal purple is because it is extremely hard to manufacture. It takes thousands and thousands of the Murex shells to get even like a gram of purple. So it's very hard to get, very expensive. So only people of wealthy status and of upper wealthy royalty status would wear purple. That's why it's called royal purple. Purple is still often associated with royalty today, which is interesting. Another very famous, and that came from an insect, an animal. Another famous dye that came out of the ancient world that we still use today is blue. Blue comes from the indigo plant, which is many different species of indigo. And indigo is native to um, India. It actually was started, it was actually first grown in the West Indies in the New World for its dye abilities. And then it was grown in North and South Carolina where with slave labor, um, indigo was cultivated and then dye was used to dye our genes, our blue genes. That's what our blue genes are dyed with is indigo. So indigo is a pretty important dye in history of the world and incorporates many things. Um, such as slave labor and the Columbian exchange and all that stuff that happened with world history. Also, it's a vat dye. So vat dyes mean that you actually have to, is it's a much more complicated process. So you actually have to like, when you initially put it into the dye bath, you have to take out the oxygen. Once you take out the oxygen, then you want to add the oxygen back in. That's what gives the coloring of the blue. So it's a much more complicated process and, um, yeah, so the slaves kind of became very, very skilled chemists being having to harvest and go and then dye the fabric with it. The other very famous dye that um, is famous not only around the world, but also here in the Southwest is red. Um, there are two beetles. One is called a Kerms beetle. And it's native to like the Greek islands, I believe it was. There, and then there's another beetle called the cochineal beetle. The cochineal beetle is native to southwestern United States, Mexico, and South America, mostly Mexico and southwestern United States. It's a beetle that lives on the on the on the leaves of prick of a prickly pear cactus. And it take again, cochineal red is very expensive because it takes a ton of beetles for it to produce anything. Um, so those were the first two um, beetle. Those were two beetles that you produced red. The first red that the humans actually produced would have been, came from matter root, would, would have come from the roots of the matter plant, which is actually an invasive species that grows in the Middle East. Uh, that was the first examples of red. And then of course the Kerms beetle was discovered. And it's actually a chemical called, called alzarin um, that is found in a Kerms beetle that allows it, that gives it the red dye. And then the cochineal beetle is called carminic acid. And still to this day, we still use carminic acid um, in foods and cosmetics and other things that we dye with red. Um, so when the Spanish came to the new world, they discovered that this brilliant red that the Aztecs had discovered and had been using, and they capitalized on it. If any of you are Catholics have been in Catholic church, you know that Catholics love their red. So red was a sought after popular, sought after color for the Spanish. And so along with gold and silver, the cochineal beetle, the red dye became a very, came like a very staple, staple cash crop, you could say for the Spanish empire. So very important for the Spanish empire to the point that the Spanish actually only allowed um, cochineal beetle dye to be exported through their ports, not through anyone else's ports. So you had to, so yeah, so it was actually a very expensive dye. Um, red was very expensive. Also, amaranth, the plant amaranth that is native to the southwestern United States and Mexico um, that was used for food was also used for dye, especially the red amaranth was used to dye pink, gave it a nice pink dye. And yeah, so yeah, and the thing about that's interesting about these dyes is that all the flags, the reason why all the flags pre-1856 were red, white, and blue was because that was red and blue were very color fast and um, prolific dyes to get. So that was pretty interesting. Also, um, oftentimes in American history, you hear the term lobster backs or red coats. Um, uh, the British Army would wear red coats. So, and they got those red coats from that matter root because matter is actually cheaper than cochineal beetle. Um, again, cochineal beetle is expensive. 
Uh, during the American Civil War, you also hear often the term butternut squash uniforms or butternut, butternut uniforms. That term came from dyeing their uniforms with the barks of a butternut tree. So that those are some popular dyes. Um, in 1856, um, a guy named by the name Williams Perkins discovered synthetic dyes that, by accident. Actually, he was testing, he was trying to find a cure for malaria, and he was working with quinine and coal tar and accidentally dyed a, a silk scarf with a mauve color. Just interestingly enough, he discovered the purple. So, and after 1856, the world started using synthetic dyes. And th synthetic dyes are really important because synthetic dyes um, pretty much kind of gave birth to the whole organic chemistry industry in terms of providing um, pharmaceuticals, um, plastics, um, chemicals for perfumes, things like that. Um, so, yeah, synthetic dye is pretty important for that. Um, one of the most important, well, not, not important, probably one of the famous synthetic dyes was the green dye called arsenic. Called, I mean, it was a green dye that contained arsenic. And yeah, so that's pretty much about a little bit about the dye in history. So the dyes that I'm working with today is three dyes that are native to this area. For plants that are native to this area, I should say. The first one is called crab apple, and crab apple gives a very nice pink light color. So that's the first one I would used. The second one that I used is choke cherry. Choke cherry is very prolific in this North America area, area of North America. Um, it's the plant has been used for all sorts of things, food, medicine, and dyes, and it gives a very nice purple dye. These are some examples of choke cherries. When they're ripe, they come out as very dark purple. And actually, here's an example of crab apples right there. Don't have an example of rabbit brush right now, but give it away. The third dye that I'm using that I used is called rabbit brush. And rabbit brush um, was used for a lot of different uses as well by the Native Americans. Um, the plant, the green leaves were used to dye things green. The yellow um, flowers were used to dye things yellow. Um, the stems are very thick, so they were used for um, basketry and things of that nature. Um, so all three of these dyes were made from local plants, and they were used by Native Americans for thousands of years. And dyes are very important in history because they change history and they impact history. So thank you for joining me.